Welcome to Anderson University, South Carolina, and welcome to Math 160, Discrete Methods. In this class, we would use the text Discrete Mathematics and its Applications by Kenneth H. Rosen, 7th edition. Now, if you do not have the 7th edition, the lectures should be generic enough to benefit you. As a matter of fact, even if you do not use the text by Kenneth Rosen, uh, you should still be able to get some benefit out of these lectures. We would go ahead and start off with chapter one, the foundations, logic and proofs. The first part deals with propositional logic, and that involves the language of propositions, section 1.1, applications, section 1.2, and logical equivalences, section 1.3. We're going to deal with those three sections first, then we will move on to the other sections in chapter one. Section 1.1, we would break that down to connectives, truth values, and truth tables. Precisely, the objectives for this section would be propositions, connectives, and when we talk of connectives, we are talking of negation, conjunction, disjunction, implication, contrapositive, inverse, converse, and biconditional. Then we will look at truth tables. Do not get bogged down by all these terms. You'll come to realize that they are actually beautiful. Okay, let's go ahead and start with propositions. What is a proposition or what is a statement? A proposition is a declarative sentence that is either true or false, but not both. So that is an exclusive or. That means it is either true or it's false, but it cannot be both. An inclusive or would mean that it could either be A or B or both. So some examples would be the moon is made of green cheese. That is a declarative sentence. Whether it's true or false, we really don't care at this point, but that is a proposition. Trenton is the capital of New Jersey. That also is a proposition. Toronto is the capital of Canada. One plus zero is one. That is a declarative sentence. It could be true. It could be false. Zero plus zero equals two. That also is a declarative sentence which could either be true or false. So that is a proposition. Everyone from Fruit Kang Kang is wild. A declarative sentence could be true or false, but it's a proposition. So what kind of sentences would not constitute a proposition? Sit down. Neither true nor false. It's not a declarative sentence. So this is not a proposition. What time is it? It's not a proposition. X plus 1 equals 2. The reason why this one is not a proposition is because it could be both true and false depending on the value of X. If X is 1, then that's true. If X is 5, then it's not true. We cannot have that. Same thing with X plus Y equals Z. That would not be a proposition. Or, whatever happened to honesty, that is not a declarative sentence, that is either true or false. Now that we have an idea of what a proposition is, we can go ahead and look at propositional logic. Constructing propositions. Propositional variables are lowercase letters such as P, Q, R, S, T, and so on and so forth. If a proposition is always true, then we would denote that with uppercase T. And if it is always false, then we would denote that with uppercase F. Now, just as in algebra, where we did things like 10 divided by 2 plus 5 minus 3 raised to the power 6 and so on and so forth, and used PEMDAS to evaluate such expressions, we would have a similar scenario with logic. And of course, just as we use addition, subtraction, multiplication, exponents, we also have connectives that we use in logic. And these are the connectives. Number one, negation, which could use this symbol or just the wiggle. So wiggle P or negation P is read not P. Or we can also read this as it is not the case that P happens. Conjunction, which is easier read as and, 
we have P conjunction Q or P and Q. The third is disjunction, which is probably better read as O. P disjunction Q is read P or Q, and this O here is the inclusive O, which means it could be P, it could be Q, or it could be both. And then we have the implication P implies Q, or better seen as if P, then Q. If P happens, then Q would happen. And lastly, we have the biconditional P if and only if Q. Or P is a necessary and sufficient condition for Q. Now, let's go ahead and give you the truth tables for these connectives. Then we will move on to constructing compound complex propositions with all these connectives. Number one, let's construct the truth table for not P, negation P. Now, let me just state this clearly. If there are N propositions in the compound statement, then there will be 2 to the N truth values in a column divided evenly, i.e., if there are n propositions in our compound proposition, then in a single column, there would be two raised to the power n truth values. In this first case, we have not p. There is only one proposition in that statement. So there would be two raised to the power one, two truth values divided evenly between t and f. So under p, we have true false and not p would be not true is false not false is true and this would be the truth table for negation p or not p example if p is the statement the earth is round then not p would be the earth is not round or it is not the case that the earth is round the next connective is the conjunction or and and is true if and only if both propositions are true p and q how many propositions are here two so how many truth values should we have in a column two raised to the power two which is four divided evenly so p would be true true false false and q would be true false true false now i'll show you what happens when we have eight that is three propositions and eight truth values so you see we divide this evenly two t t two f's then we go t f t f if you look at this very carefully we have all the possible combinations true 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 false false true false false but it's a lot easier to do it this way so what is p and q true and true is true true and false is false false and true is false false and false is false so this is the truth table for the conjunction an example p is the statement i am at home and q the statement it is raining then p and q would be i am at home and it is raining okay now let's look at the disjunction or for the inclusive or it would be false only when both propositions are false and you have to watch that very carefully because if i say that at the party tonight i am going to take a scoop of ice cream or a slice of pie that means i could take a scoop of ice cream only i could take a slice of pie only or i could take both and i'll still be good okay so p or q here is the truth table for p or q true or true is true true or false is true false or true is true false or false is false okay and you can see exactly why that is the case if you were to think of the little example i just gave at the party tonight i'll take either a scoop of ice cream or a slice of pie i take a scoop of ice cream i take a slice of pie i'm good i take a scoop of ice cream i do not take a slice of pie i'm still good I do not take a scoop of ice cream. I took a slice of pie. I'm good. I do not take a scoop of ice cream. I do not take a slice of pie. That's not good. False. Example. 
if P is the statement I am at home and Q is the statement it is raining, then P or Q would be I am at home or it is raining. Now, a quick reminder on the connective or. I did mention already that we have the exclusive or and we have the inclusive or. The inclusive or is what is known as an or. And the exclusive or is either one or the other. It cannot be both. If it is the exclusive or, then the notation would be this and not the V sign. Okay? And in this case, true or true would be false because only one of them can be true. True or false will be true. False or true will be true. And false or false will be false. So this is the truth table for the exclusive or, which is very different from the truth table of the inclusive or. Okay, let's move on to implication. Probably the best way to look at P implies Q would be in the form if P, then Q. The only time that the implication is false is when we have true implies false. True implies false would have to be false. If it is sunny today, I'm going to go running. If it is sunny and I do not go out running, then there is a problem. That is false. Everything else would be true. Think about it. So here is the truth table. True implies true is true. If it is sunny today and then I actually do go out and run, then I'm good. If it is sunny today and I do not go out and run, then I've actually gone contrary to what I promised or what I declared. So that would be false. If it is not sunny today and I go out running, I have not defied my statement. My statement was, if it is sunny today, I will be out there running. It is not sunny, but I'm out there running. I didn't defy anything. I didn't go contrary to my statement. So that's true. F implies F. It is not sunny today and I'm not out there running. I did not defy my statement. So that is true. So the only time P implies Q is false is when true implies false. Another example, if P denotes I am at home and Q says it is raining, then P implies Q would mean that if I am at home, then it is raining. Now, would you translate T implies T, T implies F, F implies T, F implies F, following the statements P being I am at home and Q being it is raining. For example, recall that I did say that if I am at home, then it is raining. So this statement would mean I am at home, but it is not raining. Did I defy my statement? Did I go contrary to my original statement? Yes. I said if I am at home, then it is raining. Now I am at home and it is not raining. That is a problem. Okay. In P implies Q, P is known as the hypothesis and Q is known as the conclusion. At times we call the hypothesis antecedent or premise. You would hear this very often in everyday discussion. What's the premise? You're building your conclusion on which premises. Okay, so hypothesis would be your premise and Q would be your conclusion or the consequence. Because of the importance of the implication, let's talk a little bit more about the implication, understanding implication. In P implies Q, there does not need to be any connection between the antecedent or the consequent. The meaning of P implies Q depends only on the truth values of P and Q. For example, if the moon is made of green cheese, then I have more money than Bill Gates. Really no connection, but I can tell you what the truth value would be. Number one, the moon is not made up of green cheese. And number two, I do not have more money than Bill Gates. So this would be F implies F. And the answer is T. That's interesting. Look at the next one. If the moon is made of green cheese, then I am on welfare. If one plus one equals three, then your grandma wears combat boots. For each of these problems, you realize that we really don't care very much what the truth value of Q would be. As long as the truth value of P is false, the solution will be T. Let's go back to our truth table. As long as the truth value for P is F, we end up with T. 
It doesn't matter what we have here. Whether we have T or F, we end up with T. One way to view the logical conditional is to think of an obligation or a contract. If I am elected, then I will lower taxes. Think about that. If I am elected, then I will lower taxes. If you get 100% on the final, then you get an A. Now, let's look at this. If the politician is actually elected and does not lower taxes, then the voters can say that he or she has broken the campaign pledge. But any other way, he or she has not broken the campaign pledge. If the politician is not elected, but somehow succeeds to lower taxes, the politician is good. If the politician is not elected and the politician does not lower taxes, the politician is good. So the only time the politician goes against campaign promises would be if the politician is elected and the politician does not lower taxes, which would be true implies false. Any other combination would be true, but for T implies F. Something similar holds for the professor. This corresponds to the case where P is true and Q is false. There are several different ways of expressing P implies Q. I do not expect you to memorize all these different ways of expressing P implies Q, but I expect that if you see a couple of them, you should be able to know that that's the expression for P implies Q. The first one is the obvious one. If P, then Q. If P, Q. Q unless not P. This is a little bit more exciting, and I'll explain this later. Q if P. Q whenever P. Q follows from P. P implies Q. P only if Q. Q when P. P is sufficient for Q. Q is necessary for P. So we have all these different ways of expressing P implies Q, but what we would probably mostly use in this class would be if P then Q. P implies Q if p q and we may also use p is sufficient for q or q is necessary for p and we could also use a necessary condition for p is q and a sufficient condition for q is p we would probably not use this a lot in this class we would concentrate on the ones i had mentioned before we would pause the lecture at this point and call it section 1.1.1 when we return, we would look at section 1.1 part 2 and start with the words converse, contrapositive, inverse, and then look at the biconditional. Thank you very much, and I will see you in section 1.1 part 2. God bless you.